please welcome Carol Bornstein. Inviting me to take Dave's place. Uh, I don't know if you all knew that. I imagine many of you do, did know that Dave Frost was supposed to be giving this talk and he um, had an unexpected engagement and actually asked me to step in for him. So I'm um, trying to do justice to what he was going to talk about this afternoon um, how to improve aesthetics in the native garden. And I have several hard acts to follow here, especially those quail. That was just so much fun. <laughs> Well, I guess my first, my first thought that I want to share with you, um, and it's been raised by several other speakers, just to, has to do with this issue of um, how we define beauty in a garden. What, it, what is uh, beauty to each one of us? And there's really no one answer, of course. It, it's a highly individual question, and only each one of us can answer it for ourselves. And then tied to that is the, the um, term low maintenance. Um, I think Glenn said something about this, that, you know, that too many people think that natives don't require any kind of maintenance, that you can plant them and walk away. I, I'm sure that many of you already have learned that. That's not true, with perhaps just a few exceptions. Um, when I teach classes about using native plants in a garden, I always like the analogy that Owen Dell taught me many years ago. Um, how many of you are familiar with Owen Dell? Is that name? Okay, that registers with a lot of you. A very progressive landscape designer and writer, whose book, by the way, um, Sustainable Landscaping for Dummies, is a must-have. It's just filled with um, all kinds of wonderful information. Um, he, he shared with me a thought that he had years ago um, when he was starting out as a landscape contractor that you know, we, we give so much attention to our cars um, we buy them, we spend a lot of money on them, we put gas in them all the time, which is of course getting more and more expensive. We change the oil, we get them tuned up, uh, we rotate the tires, we do all these things to our cars because, you know, they're important to us. And just if you make that analogy to the amount of maintenance we provide for our cars um, and, and translate that into the garden, which is equally as valuable not only to us but to nature and to wildlife and the benefits that accrue. Maybe that will give us a slightly different perspective on um, the benefits of maintaining our gardens. So whether it's low, medium, high, um, obviously there are some benefits in providing some kind of maintenance in the landscape, whether it's a native garden or not. And the other part of that, uh, that thought with respect to maintenance and, and beauty, how they um, are uh, very closely connected, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. Um, in teaching classes, I've come to, to appreciate that my aesthetic is not necessarily the same as the students in my classes or my friends or my colleagues. Something that I might find incredibly beautiful um, is just too manicured, maybe uh, too tidy, um, whereas other people like something a little bit more on the shabby chic side of the scale, and so we each have to find our, our own path to beauty in the garden. Oops, I think I just did the wrong thing. There we go. Well, many people have shown slides of, of um, nature, and so, of course, that's an inspiration, I think, for all of us, and so just a few examples here of how nature does um, her compositions. Uh, this is down in Anza Borrego State Park. Um, I need to step back a little, and I'm afraid that, that it might affect the microphone here, so tell me if uh, it becomes a problem. This is a, a local canyon, uh, just in the Santa Barbara area, looking down from the trail on a little rivulet that was formed during one of the recent floods, or not floods, one of the rains, looking at a big leaf maple in its deciduous stage. And it reminded me of a Japanese garden. Very simplistic beauty. Chaparral. How are these projecting? Is the, are the, are the lights too bright? Should they go, come down a little bit? It's okay, or they should come down. Some people are saying come down, so I guess it's okay. All right, this is um, some absolutely stunning chaparral vegetation around Figaro Mountain. 
all kinds of greens and grains, different textures and colors interwoven together. And then a closer look at some of the chaparral that grows in my backyard. Um, beautiful mosaic pan pattern here of purple sage, woolly blue curls, and adenostoma and golden yarrow. And if this was in your garden, I think many of us would be happy with that combination. Although, for those of us who will maybe want things a little tidier, you might want to edit out some of those dead branches that are leaving through. Or not. So what we're really talking about, I think, if we're trying to achieve uh, both beauty and low maintenance together in a garden, is sustainable landscaping. And here's just a few um, um, explanations of what those terms mean. And we're really trying to minimize inputs and outputs in the garden from a both a cost standpoint and a labor standpoint, and also to not um, impact natural areas, whether it's in our own backyard or someplace else. Um, several of the speakers have talked a little bit, um, either directly or indirectly, about planning. And I think that's absolutely critical. Not that you have to have every single detail figured out in advance, but just a general game plan, a roadmap of what you're trying to achieve in your garden or in your client's garden. Um, and that reminds me, I wanted to show of hands, how many people in the audience are landscape professionals or in the design world? Oh, quite a lot of you. Okay, so you all know this, but anyway, doesn't, I guess it doesn't hurt to reinforce what you know. Um, so getting it right from the start, or at least attempting to, um, to plan for not only the moment and the immediate um, gratif instant gratification, but where your garden is going to be several years down the road, because uh, that's something that I think the art of landscape design um, really is in a, in a field, no pun intended, of its own, because of the, the element of time. And, um, and that's not always easy to figure out. As far as style, really any, any um, Bernard referred to this in his presentation, anything is possible. It doesn't have to be wild and woolly, it can be formal as well as informal or naturalistic when using native plants. This is some of our garden heritage that uh, has informed a lot of our ideas about landscaping, but obviously this works really well in England and not so well in California unless you just love to spend all your time pruning and watering. And most of us really don't want to be that slavish to our gardens. Nor, nor do we want this. I think we can appreciate it, maybe. <laughs> not, you know, not for ourselves. I mean, I do think there's beauty in that, but I don't want to do that in my own garden. And the classic English perennial border. This is much more informal. And yet, this is a really high art, the composition itself, combining these plants so that you get these beautiful um, combinations of both colors and textures and undulating forms, and to have it be um, in bloom throughout the entire growing season. Of course, England doesn't have the same growing season as we do here in California. But I think that the ideal of this is possible in California. And we can do this with California native plants, if that's our goal. This is a, a, just a very modest little example of a mixed border uh, in a park in Santa Barbara. Another gardening heritage uh, that has come across the other pond is from Japan. Uh, some Japanese and other Asian gardens are very highly stylized and very manicured, whereas some are quite informal. Um, at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, uh, a Japanese tea garden was um, designed and installed many years ago, and here's just a little piece of it, with a um, Port Orford cedar, manzanitas, native irises, barberries, and bunch grasses. It's a fairly simple palette, mostly green, um, and very informal, and it's all entirely California native plants. A little bit closer to home for me down in Southern California, um, just seeing some native uh, deer grass in the wild. Again, this is back at the uh, Figaro Mountain area. And then in a garden in, Ma in the Malibu area where they were really trying to draw their direct inspiration from nature with grasses and 
young planting here of uh, one of the low growing forms of black sage as well as salvia point sal. It's a very understated, simple palette with the local stone. And I included this image just because it, it's sort of symbolic to me of how in, in years past at the Grand Estates in California, at least in the Santa Barbara area, where they were still holding on to and embracing the Italian and French and Spanish tradition, both architecturally and in the garden, when right outside the wall was a beautiful, mature coast live oak. Not invited in, but part of the borrowed landscape. And I think we can you know, be more successful in, in marrying those two worlds today. And clearly, all of you are interested in that. So whether you have um, the opportunity to garden on a grand scale, such as uh, this landscape in uh, the Santa Barbara area, this is just a small piece of um, a new installation of a, a Carex lawn, or a much more modest um, suburban type of front, front garden where you don't have a lot of real estate to play with. I think considering the scale and the budget that you have available is clearly, you know, those are two factors that need to be taken into account when you're planning uh, for your garden. Bernard showed some fabulous detailed um, um, drawings of uh, the site analysis and whether you're, again, whether your project is large or small, you do need to take stock of what you're starting with. I don't know what anything about this image, I just downloaded it from the internet, but just a, a simple example of you, you, you need to know what you're starting with and look around your neighborhood to see what examples of maybe native plants or Mediterranean plants are doing well uh, to provide you with some ideas and some inspiration. Developing a planting plan um, should, should follow from that. And we've heard a lot about using local natives because they tend to be better adapted and generally that's true. Um, not always the case, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb, I think. One of the golden rules of any planting, no matter what the materials are that you're using, are right plant, right place. And here, um, on the bottom uh, image is actually rosemary with a bougainvillea stuck in the middle of it. And for those of you who have grown either one of those, you know that they both are very um, tough, of fairly aggressive plants that get fairly large. And to planting the two of them together, even though they're both um, horticulturally compatible, drought tolerant, sun loving plants, putting them together in such close quarters is clearly a recipe for disaster because you're going to constantly be pruning one or the other. And such is the case with the um, California buckwheat in the upper left image, planted with some succulents, um, again, compatible from a, a cultural standpoint, but you can probably not make out, let's see, which one of these is the point? Center. Oh, we've got a separate thing here. Okay. Right there, you probably you can hardly see it. There's actually an agave <laughs> that's already been eaten up by the um, Areogonum fasciculatum, and that buckwheat is going to constantly be spilling over the edge of the of the brick um, paving. I just leave. So, right plant, right place. Unless you just want to be out there puttering all the time. I think this is a slightly better example of uh, composition and, and, and keeping in mind the, um, who your partners are in the garden. The Areogonum arborescence is filling um, the terrace above the uh, stone retaining wall and spilling over slightly but not interfering with the space of the Artemisia pycnocephala David's choice below in that very narrow strip above the curb. So they're not going to you know, fight with each other. 